All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to day four. Uh, this is our final day of the 2021 Venue Annual Public Health Conference. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you to those who joined us on multiple evenings. Um, we're excited to, uh, we, we have some exciting things planned for our last day here. Um, so uh, once again, uh, we asked uh, that you please um, keep yourselves on mute uh, as we get through the presentations and we will have time um, for, for Q&A. And at that time, you know, we'll, we'll uh, allow you guys to kind of come off of mute and ask questions if you want to. Obviously, feel free to put your questions, comments in the chat. Um, and yeah, anybody who's labeled as, as PHSO, um, if, if you have any tech issues or anything, you have questions, definitely feel free to message one of us on there. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. So we have two uh, presentations lined up for today. We have our first one, which is the Digital Health Trends and Social Media Misinformation presentation. Really excited for that one. Um, and then we have the Whole Body Approach to Health, uh, which is a project we have been working on with some community partners through the university. So uh, we're excited to talk about some of these emerging trends in public health um, with, uh, with these two presentations. And uh, with that, um, I'm going to pass it to Ellie to um, introduce our first presentation. Awesome, thank you. So with our digital, um, sorry, social media and misinformation and digital health trends, um, I'm excited to, hold on, I don't know what's happening here. Right, here we go. Here we go. Can you guys see this slides? All right, perfect. Um, we have uh, some of our own PHO mem PHSO members. Uh, we have Chris, Maria, Merced, Ashley, and Karen. With that, go ahead and take the floor. All right, thank you, Ellie. Um, you can go ahead and go onto the next slide. And thank you everyone for being here this evening. Um, so just to give an introduction, my name is Maria Sanchez. I I am a Benedictine University alumni. I do have my Master of Public Health and a Certificate in Epidemiology. I also received my Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology from the University of New Mexico. And I do have some of my research interests listed on the slide. And if you do need to connect with me or if you have any questions after the conference, please go ahead and feel free to email me. All right, you can go to the next slide. All right, so I just wanna go over um, our social media misinformation introduction. So last year, about March, 2020, uh, students and the PHSO at Benedictine got together and we created a webinar that was titled Social Media and Health Promotion. And one of the topics that we highlighted was social media misinformation and um, so pretty much what we, you know, talked about was certain, um, yeah, just like certain de details about, you know, what took place. It was at the beginning of the pandemic. So there were certain things about the misinformation that was happening on social media platforms. And as we went further into the, you know, pandemic, it seemed like it was starting to evolve. So we'd want to highlight that, those details today. Um, there are certain social media platforms um, that have made some changes to their policy to combat some of the misinformation. Facebook happens to be one of them. And just to go over what they have been doing, they have implemented programs like machine learning assistant programs. Um, these, this program typically searches for spam accounts and how they're able to locate spam accounts is they um, pretty much look at the behavior of what their involvement is on social media. So what kind of advertisements they're purchasing, the likes and dislikes that are generated on their uh, status updates. If certain postings have more dislikes, it could warrant maybe that the posting may have made social media users on Facebook maybe uncomfortable or perhaps maybe there are a lot of dislikes because the information is not correct. So that's some of the ways that this program is set up to um, look for like those spam accounts. Um, other, uh, other programs that are implemented, um, 
by Facebook, they also um, have pretty much partnered with like third party fact checking organizations. And what they do is they look at, um, they, they pretty much find misinformation on social media posting on Facebook. If you go to the next slide, all right, so you'll see an image on the slide and sorry, if you guys hear me meowing in the background. Um, so there is a box typically that will pop up on certain posts. You may have seen it and it does say disputed by third parties. So that's where these third party fact checking organizations come in. Um, they're pretty much there to inform you that the story that you might be sharing or might be viewing has some misleading information and they do give you the option to go forward with sharing the information, but you know, to, just to take caution that it might be misleading or you can also just cancel it. Um, hopefully, you know, you won't share it, um, but just in case those are some, some of the ways that fact checkers have helped Facebook with managing misinformation. If you go to the next slide, so since we're on the topic of misinformation, I don't, we don't want you to feel discouraged from using social media. It does have its advantages. It does have its disadvantages. Some advantages that we did highlight last year um, during our webinar was that it does allow you to have fast access to information. So if you wanted to get quick highlights to certain news articles or certain updates, you can, you can stay connected with family and friends. Um, the healthcare providers are starting to use social media to communicate with their patients. Um, they're also even just promoting health communication through social media platforms. And some of the disadvantages though are um, headlines that you might read might be meant to be scary. If you look at the image on the right, um, it does say horrifying new map shows no country is safe from coronavirus's deadly tentacles. And that is pretty scary. Um, has word horrifying, no country is safe, coronavirus's deadly tentacles. And so pretty much the journalists of this article um, who posted about this, um, I guess this topic, they stated that the tentacles, those red lines that you see, it looks like there's an there's a point of origin, it's roughly around the China um, country. They pretty much were stating that each line represented 5 million Wuhan citizens or residents were fleeing Wuhan city during, well, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, as we all now know, 2021, that actually is not true, that never happened. Wuhan residents did not flee Wuhan city. Um, the real story behind that map that you're looking at is that they're actually flight routes and they have nothing to do with the COVID-19 pandemic. They're flight routes of individuals who, it's true, they did leave Wuhan city, but they were there attending an event before Wuhan city went into a quarantine lockdown. So those are detailing the flight routes that left Wuhan city two weeks prior to when they went into a lockdown. So. There's a lot of misleading information. Um, it can, you know, spread like wildfire. I believe that this particular article got about seven million views. So that is approximately seven million people who actually viewed this article. So it's it can be damaging. Um, no matter how many times that this may have been removed from the internet it still has been shared from one individual to another. So it can't really be gone. Um, other disadvantage that we did highlight was that some news articles or some information on social media may lack citation usage. If you go to the next slide. So this might, if you look at the picture, that might be, um, actually it is an example of how the lack of citations really do um, affect what we're seeing on Facebook. So it pretty much shows an individual who is through. The message there is that COVID-19 typically just stays in your throat for a while. 
few days, I guess, and eventually it moves down to your throat. Um, if you drink water, do a lot of gurgling with warm water and use salt and vinegar, it's pretty much gonna eliminate the virus from your throat. If you do it before it gets reaches your lungs, um, spread this information because you can save someone with this information. There's no source and you can't put a source because this is completely not factual. So, so we're going on social media, just attention to some of these like trends and some of these instances. Um, so another emerging trend that we are seeing on social media is disinformation. And there is a difference between disinformation and misinformation. So um, disinformation is actually the intentional distribution of misleading information. It is used to cause harm and it's used to attain power, money, um, maybe heighten someone's reputation. And so when you look at misinformation, that's actually the unintentional um, pretty much spread of misinformation. So we all may have participated in spreading misinformation. We may not even know it. Um, if you go to the next slide, maybe an individual shared this specific picture of Dr. Fauci. They're saying that he said in this picture, in this meme, just because thousands of independent doctors are saying that hydrochloroquine cures all COVID-19 patients, it is not valid until we have a major study done. They're saying that he also said, as soon as this COVID-19 vaccine is manufactured, it must be immediately delivered to healthcare professionals worldwide for human injection. Proper studies can be, formed, be, can be performed later. Um, to, you know, to someone who may not know Dr. Fauci or maybe not know healthcare professionals very well or may not know research or what in this disease research looks like, I think that, yeah, he's pretty influential. He probably did say that because the statement doesn't sound completely ignorant, but it actually is false. There's no citation to, to pretty much um, tie into any information that he actually factually said this. So um, definitely keep in mind when you are on social media that this information, it looks good, but it's actually false. Um, if you go on to the next slide. All right, so just kind of to recap on the, evalu on the evolution of social media misinformation. So most social media platforms are implementing programs to help combat the spread of misinformation, just as what we reviewed, Facebook is um, doing what they can. It's not perfect. I think a lot more work can be done um, we definitely have a long way to go, but um, yeah, I think it's so far, it's not 100% work um, all the way there, but I think it's somewhat working. Uh, if you happen to see misinformation, definitely address it. Um, feel free to share any citations or factual information and, and, sor sor or and sources where you find them. Um, post that with your message on any social media form. And of course, disinformation isn't new, um, but occurring as we speak. And just be mindful whenever you're on social media platforms, even the, just the internet on someone's blog, be mindful of the kind of content that you're reading and always do your own fact checking. All right, and can if you go to the next slide? All right, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Morissette. All right, thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Um, so my name is Morissette Ayachemi, and I'm a Master of Public Health candidate at Benedictine University. I did my undergrad at Trinity Washington University, and my research interest is our epidemiology, health inequality, and social determinants of health, nutrition, and infectious diseases. And if you'd like to connect with me um, after this conference, um, feel free to connect me at my email address down below. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so why public health marketing campaigns are important. 
Well, they're important for several reasons. Um, they are able to influence the public to adopt certain behaviors and inform the public on health issues like tobacco or um, the use of sunscreen and health promotion and improving the health status of communities. They raise awareness. They also help healthcare professionals, practitioners, and the general public make informed decisions. And they have the ability to reach target audiences and supports public health efforts. Um, next slide, please. Um, public health marketing campaigns promote healthy behaviors such as hand washing um, to prevent the spread of COVID-19, which is one of the um, prevention methods um, that uh, the CDC has recommended to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And for example, uh, there was a social media campaign study that was launched in the Netherlands and was found to influence the public's behavior towards hand washing. The campaign was promoted through the news and the social media. Researchers found an association between participants who were exposed to um, different methods like video ads, infographics, and the participants who were exposed to these different formats that um, promoted hand washing um, actually improved their personal hygiene. Next slide, please. And so strategies to combat misinformation on a campaign level. Um, so social media is the most popular media platform for sharing information, um, more popular than um, the television, media, or radio. Uh, social media really took the lead during COVID-19 to share um, information. Um, some popular platforms are Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Um, they still remain the most popular social media platforms. Public health marketing campaigns can use social media and other media platforms, including also, as I mentioned, radio, television, the internet, and newspaper to raise public health awareness on health matters and ensure the public receives accurate health information. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a infographic. Um, this were some of the methods that the World Health Organization um, made available to the public to share and to just prove some of the myths that were, that were circulating about um, COVID-19. Um, as you can see um, with this graphic, one of the myths was that um, viruses was being spread through radio waves, mobile networks, um, or 5G networks. Um, so as you can see, it actually um, gives the actual truth of how COVID-19 is spread um, through respiratory droplets, as we know, but through coughs, sneezes, or speaks. Um, so this was one of the examples that the World Health Organization on the website actually made available to the public to share. So you could go on their website and you can share this through your social media feeds, through Facebook and other platforms. Next slide, please. So the best way to articulate a public health message to create trust in consumers, which is important in um, actually getting public's trust is to hire independent fact checkers. Um, social media managers like Facebook and Twitter can guide their users directly to the WHO or CD website. And healthcare departments could partner with social media influencers to share evidence-based health information to target audiences. And also we, strong leadership is important that could build trust and relationships with community members, advocates and other partners to reach communities and address their needs and inform the public on the role of public health. Um, as, as we could um, understand that not many people might not understand the role of public health. So, um, informing the public what we actually do could actually help with the trust issue. Um, be transparent and inform the public about what is known and not known about a particular public health um, issue. Make information accessible to the public. And also another um, tool is to appoint a spokesperson who deliver accurate information to the public. Next slide, please. Okay, and um, continue with trust. Um, other ways to um, build trust in communities 
Um, you could do a needs assessment to um, understand some of the barriers um, and issues with consumer trust. Um, some of the barriers could be um, like high cost of care, um, inadequate insurance coverage could be some of the barriers to um, health care. And another um, example is public health must consider the history and political context of current needs of the community when articulating public health messages and address questions and concerns of the community. And lastly, community members need to feel that their needs matter, uh, that they're being heard, public health interventions that balance the health and economic and other needs of the community can improve consumer trust. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Morissette and Maria for your presentations. It was a blast working with you. My name is Christopher Brotrak. I am finishing up my MPH shortly here and for the next couple months. And currently I work at the Medical College of Wisconsin as clinical research coordinator. And then my professional interests are health equity, epidemiology and infectious disease. If you need to get a hold of me, my email is on the slide or you're feel to, free to look me up on LinkedIn as well. Next slide. Just a nice intro title with some great graphic art behind it, which is mechanisms to combat misinformation and the future directions of where we go from here in terms of combating the misinformation, disinformation campaigns that we see online. Next slide. All right. So the solution is found in how we think. We can't really control how people use the internet. It's in the privacy of their homes. And this is a continuation of the interactions between misinformation and how to spread online. So in order to solve the issue with misinformation, there needs to be an understanding how misinformation is spread through human online interaction. Um, there is some good news, but mostly sad news in terms of the epidemic that is the misinformation. The good news is according to a Pew study that 64% of Americans believe that the spreading of fake news is a problem, which is a term I know we are all familiar with. The downside of the study is that out of 1,116 survey participants, 51% believes that issues and misinformation will not improve, while 23% of individuals admitted to sharing fabricated information and somehow knew it was falsified information, and some did not. And that it's a very big blanket statement, but overall, the knowing of spreading misinformation is what you know, makes me more concerned than not. Next slide. So whose responsibility at the end of the day is to mitigate fake news? There is not heavy regulations on internet, especially in terms of social media. I know there are campaigns making it grow. And are there any, what are the entities and are they widely known that people can advocate for themselves on, online? So del delving into what there is currently is what tools do companies and people have to combat misinformation? And as we saw referring to Maria's presentation, the tool on Facebook, what software is out there to mitigate this misinformation and who is controlling these companies? And how is the basic scientific method that we learned throughout all of our science courses up until our master's in public health used to combat misinformation? Next slide. So there was a great joke that I love for researching this. It was by Mindy Kaling in her Harvard commencement speech. She goes, what does the Harvard Kennedy School do? Oh, they just get a master's and boring me at a conversation at a party. Well, luckily here's some light to shine on the Harvard Kennedy School is that they created their own version of the scientific method to combat misinformation online. And those are measurement designs. Who engages in mis with misinformation and why? Unique data sets with increased validity. As we've learned before in the previous presentations, disinformation campaigns, which interventions do we use, and the importance of data sharing. So in referring back to the, to the measurement and design, what populations are being targeted? What do researchers know about specific populations and how they interact with social media? How does this make us vulnerable on the internet? And in terms of vulnerable, it really goes down to which population is using each um, social media medium and how they're being used and how they're counting the likes and counting the shares and seeing who will actually share them and fine tuning the ways to spread those messages. 
For number two, if they know the target population, they can understand these populations and essence understand why they choose to spread the neglect of fake news. For three, the spread of increased positive or negative news bias toward a new story or campaign by removing unfavorable variants. So essentially, they're either going to increase the bias towards the vector, I'll say the vector of choice and seeing how what can I remove to increase the movement of the story for which population that I want it to move. And then I'll skip four since we over disinformation campaigns. And number five, how do we intervene with the with information campaigns or disinformation campaigns? And that goes to more how do we regulate the internet and the importance of data sharing. So there are, there are huge, huge databases and they're collective. So examples like Wikipedia, there are other examples that we'll go over later in this, in this presentation of where does data come from? And the more data there is, the more validity something has. So the more everyone is publicly sharing their data, either on research or a news article, the more we'll get, have more data points to uncover the real answers. Slide. Settling a closer look at a service level. Applying the method of research dissemination in terms of investigating the misspread of social media content that can create or harm, in this instance, increase the positive negative bias of manipulation of data. Ex exactly what the Harvard um, or the Kennedy School said in the previous slide. According to this study, the Pew study, it exposes relationships between relationships, media, and the participants in more than one crucial way. Communication around the misinformation and per person's network relationship to data and the demographic information to disseminate who will believe this information and the likelihood of spreading this information. Slide. Existing tools to curtail the spread. And I love using that because curtailing the spread of misinformation as hopefully this pandemic doesn't last too much longer. I think all of us are getting very burnt out, but it's so extremely important is to look at the tools that are being applied to you. So DIRT protocol is a crowdsourcing blockchain tool that allows anyone to enter data, then another person to challenge the data. And that was entered, that was entered. This is a form of testing the data's validity and will increase the internal or external validity as it was challenged. So that's what I was saying from the previous slide is the more data we have, the more data you have to offer, the more we can stop the spread of misinformation by combating mal data. And if any of you know what metadata is, metadata is what the data behind is an image or a story. When was it posted? When was it shared? So a really great app is Get Metadata Viewer. And there's many different kinds. This application can show the timestamps of each photo, data, or website that's been modified. And I love the names for these. I think they all go really, you know, it, they're, they're kind of gimmicky, but they are very interesting. And then Hoaxy is a web, lastly, Hoaxy is a web-based application that monitors for an article that travels throughout the internet's universe or lifetime. So the great thing about DIRP protocol is a decentralized information creation that uses token staking to incentivize honesty like Wikipedia said before. Next slide. All right, and it's not all doom and gloom. There are startup companies that want to help curtail the spread of misinformation, disinformation campaigns. That is NewsCheck, a US-based platform that scales content review and scoring platform that is measured by the News Trust Check Trust Index. The News Check Trust Index is a very interesting tool that was created by journalists, awarded journalists that use a scale of ethics in their journalism. Cyber, which uses deep learning and processing languages using software as for service model and which encourages genuine brand interaction. So, and uh, eliminates bad, bad actors. So what, um, what I got from Cybra is the goals are to remove intimidating brands that can use or cause a bad reputation for a pilot brand. So a really great example is a fake purse in comparison to a real purse or a fake website in comparison to a real website. And then I'll go over one more. And then Blackbird AI, a, just an AI-powered court engine that identifies threat signals from deep networks and can monitor large volumes. So essentially, Blackbird AI is using large data to basically use the identifiers to eliminate those identifiers quickly. How I kind of explain this is if anyone took in biochemistry or molecular biology courses, stopping um, intrusive data for, or DNA from replicating and eliminating from the sequence. So if you understand that, then you're a nerd like me and I appreciate that. Next slide. 
And the next is Karen and she'll be presenting. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you everyone for being on tonight. As Chris mentioned, my name is Karen Incia Ababiel and I am a current master's in public health candidate Benedictine that recently just started. I currently work as an office coordinator for athletico physical therapy where we are trying to increase awareness about physical therapy as a intervention for pain management rather than utilizing opioids or other expensive tests that have the burden of cost to patients as well as the healthcare system. I received my bachelor's of science in neuroscience from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and my research interests are epidemiology, health inequality, and social determinants of health, as well as health policy. If you need to connect with me, my email is down below on the slide. So I am excited to talk to you guys about trends in digital health. Digital health has been something that has come to the forefront, specifically with the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns that are happening across the world to help clinicians as well as patients that they need to maintain um, their health. Next slide, please. But before we talk about the trends in digital health, let's define what digital health is. So according to the FDA, digital health can be defined as any technology that uses computing platforms, connectivity, software, and sensors for healthcare and related uses. These technologies can span a wide range of uses from applications in general wellness, as well as applications as a medical device. So basically digital health is the union between the health sciences as well as digital technology. When we're thinking examples of digital health, a really good one that I can think of is um, the electronic health record. So that's where clinicians can enter in any patient data information about their health. It utilizes information technology that requires a specific connectivity as well as software that they use to analyze the data that they are getting as well. And then an example for sensors could be a pacemaker or a heart monitor, just to monitor the, heart, the health of the heart as well as provide information for the clinician to make sure that if there are any abnormalities that they're able to address those. And then digital health can also include technologies intended for use as a medical product, within a medical product as companion diagnostics, which are tests or medical devices which provide information for safe and effective use for a drug or product or as an adjunct or a supplement to other medical pro products such as devices, drugs, and biologics. They also may be used to develop or study medical products. So basically digital health involves a broad range that include um, things such as your smartphone. I know for me personally, I have access to my EMR, my electronic medical record on my smartphone. That's how I'm able to communicate with my physician about any lab results that I have. Did I just cut out? I'm not sure. I saw that it said my internet was in, unstable. Uh, the last thing I heard, Morissette, was that you have your ERM access on your phone. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, I have EMR access on my phone. I'm able to contact my physician and discuss any results that I have. Another thing that's encompassed within digital health as well is um, wearable devices such as our smartwatches or fitness trackers such as Fitbit, Garmin, so on and so forth. So these can help us to track our steps, our sleep cycles, remind us about getting physical active, and then some of them also offer health scores based on our age, height, and weight to kind of determine where we're at compared to people in our certain um, demographic. And then on the bottom left, you see the picture of the laptop with a physician holding out his stethoscope, and that's representing telemedicine. It's a huge part of digital health and has become the forefront of digital health, or at least for um, research for digital health, 
as with all the lockdowns that are happening and patients still requiring to see their physicians for specific diseases, there needed to be a way for them to continue to speak with their physician and telemedicine is the way that they do that. And then the last aspect that I wanna discuss regarding the umbrella of digital health is health information technology. So that is the core of what makes a lot of these technologies on our smartphones, our fitness devices, and even through telemedicine or virtual visits possible because it's a lot of the backend operations. And that is on the bottom right, you can see that was provided by the Healthcare Information and Management System Society, which is located in Chicago, Illinois. And they are just describing the value of health information technology. So they found in their study that it increased patient infection as well as retention of staff. It decreased um, readmission rates for specific diseases as well as increased face-to-face -face contact between physicians and patients as they're not writing down all the information that they're receiving from patients. It also decreased the number of claim denials due to having accurate information on file already. And then it increased compliance with patients for specific programs that were recommended by their physicians. And finally, for with health information technology, it also is a very important cost-saving measure as well. Next slide, please. So let's discuss a little bit about the current trends in digital health. So these two graphics that we see on the slide are from CB Insights, which is a company that releases a list called the Digital Health 150 annually. And basically this list just describes digital health startups that are showing promise in the field. In 2020, they had an increase in the number of startups related to digital health primarily to address the pandemic. So on the left graphic, you can see that clinical intelligence and enablement was 17% um, of the startups for last year in 2020. And basically what clinical intelligence and enablement is referring to is anything that can help providers or payers, um, insur insurance companies make clinical decisions to deliver efficient and effective care. So with a lot of the lockdown having happening, what we saw is a lot of patients weren't really going into the clinics. So these startups kind of helped bridge the gap by creating technologies that could help clinicians provide care to the patients in an efficient, effective manner. Next, we see on the graphic that screening and diagnostics was the next highest leading category. And that includes at-home testing protocols as well as artificial intelligence enabled medical imaging. The next is virtual care delivery. So that would be our virtual visits or telemedicine. And then the final leading category or at least the one that is above 10% is disease management and therapeutics. So most of those startups were involved with creating wearable devices or medical devices to manage disease. On the right, we kind of hone in a little bit on telehealth and we see that telemedicine platforms were the majority of the telehealth subcategory in terms of the number of startups that were created. So like I mentioned before, that's truly important for making sure that physicians or any healthcare professionals, because even within our physical therapy clinic, telemedicine was something that we had to do overnight to make sure that our patients were able to get the care that they needed, even if they were not able to come into the clinic or did not feel comfortable coming into the clinic as well. Um, next slide, please. So the benefits of digital health. So, with digital health trending the way that it is, we can see that there's a lot of things that are beneficial. The first is it's accessible to both healthcare providers and patients. Like I mentioned before, you're able to connect on your smartphone, tablets, um, any device in order to kind of communicate with your healthcare provider about your care. 
Next, it also assists in managing and tracking health and wellness related activities. So that would be like with your fitness trackers. It reduces inefficiencies in care as well. Um, I know a lot of our patients talk about how their surgeons utilize robotics in their surgery. So they're able to be more precise when they're performing surgery. So um, that is a part of digital health that is very helpful in reducing inefficiencies in care. Then it also reduces the overall cost of healthcare, um, which we kind of touched on when we spoke about health information technology. Another benefit of digital health is that it can increase the quality of care as well as provide a strategy for hospital surge control. So a lot of hospitals in their environments, they were utilizing digital health services to kind of do a forward triage where they screen patients prior to coming into the emergency department to determine whether they actually had COVID-19 symptoms. And if they did, they isolated them in a specific unit to prevent any of the clinicians, the physicians and nurses from um, contracting the disease. Next slide. And then although there are some benefits um, to digital health, there are also challenges in digital health as well. So one of the challenges is access to, which is also related to the second point, implementation of digital health information systems. So in certain areas of the country, they might not have access to the technology to um, actually communicate with their physicians, or they might have might not have the broadband access to um, even connect to the internet. So we have to consider those challenges when we're thinking of digital health and how we can increase equity so that people would be able to um, have access to that. In addition, um, there's also challenges in reimbursement for digital health services as well as the standard of care. Um, digital health is not something that is regulated on a federal level. It's something that's regulated state to state. So if states are having different um, competencies for their clinicians, how we actually know what the stand the is to deliver to patients who are seeking care. And then the last challenge for digital um, health is digital health literacy. So do people understand um, the devices that they are actually utilizing. I know for me personally, um, both of my parents are seeking the COVID-19 vaccine and a lot of the scheduling that they have to do is online. However, they don't really understand a lot of the technology. So um, that could be a barrier to digital health. We are um, considering digital health. All right, and I will turn it over to Ashley, who will talk a little bit more about um, illiteracy. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Ashley. I currently work as a medical scribe at UCSF, that's University of California, San Francisco, outpatient clinics through Scribe America, uh, now transitioned to telehealth during the pandemic in the field of ophthalmology and pediatric dermatology. I'm more than halfway through my master's degree in public health here at Benedictine University with an emphasis in epidemiology, health management, and policy. I received I received my bachelor's degree at UC Davis in biochemistry, molecular biology, and that led me to spend a year teaching middle school science for Teach for America and spend time as a lab technician um, at Genentech. So next slide, please. So I'm going to talk to you about e-health literacy mostly and how it pertains to misinformation. So next slide, please. So health literacy is a degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, understand basic health information needed to make appropriate health decisions. Um, in other words, if you're given information about your health, are you able to put it into practice? So this gentleman on screen uh, just arrived home after seeing his doctor. He's been treated for a serious infection. During that visit, the doctor made several changes to his medication, asking him to increase his antibiotic and discontinue a, an antifungal medication. 
but he's really unclear which is which. But luckily, he may have access to his online patient portal where he can view this information or send his doctor a message. Now, imagine like maybe he doesn't have a computer or he didn't know how to register to his patient portal or there's a language barrier and he stopped the wrong medication. So he's more likely to need more health care with a higher rate of complication from something that is treatable and avoidable. Next slide, please. So low health literacy is more prevalent among certain populations, uh, populations with low socioeconomic status, medically underserved, belong to minority population, are older in age, or any combination of these. Uh, research shows, you know, education really matters. In a nationally representative sample, almost half of the adults who did not graduate from high school had low health literacy. And, you know, some of the greatest disparities in health literacy occur among racial and ethnic minority groups from different cultural backgrounds and those who don't speak English as a first language. So one study found that 74% of Spanish speaking patients have less than adequate health literacy compared to 7% of English speaking patients. And then low health literacy among older adults is associated with increased reports of poor physical functioning, pain, limitations of daily activities and poor mental health status. Next slide, please. So it's probably no surprise that low health literacy equals worse health care, poor health outcomes. Next slide, please. So the most comprehensive estimate of health literacy was conducted in 2003 by the Department of National Assessment. It found 36% of adults have basic or below basic health literacy levels. A uh, low health literacy costs the United States up to $238 billion annually, since they're more likely to delay or not receive health care, have more hospitalizations, have poor overall health status, and have higher mortality rates. However, it seems that the vast majority of people, not only those with basic health literacy, use low quality websites when looking for health information. So they found that 96% of people actually use unaccredited sources for at least one health question. Next slide, please. So we receive a lot of health information from different sources that you know, may or may not be very reliable, including healthcare professionals, family, friends, books, newspapers, magazines, and ever, ever increasingly online. The internet has become a very popular resource to learn about health and to investigate one's own health condition. However, given the large amount of inaccurate information online, people can very easily become misinformed. Next slide, please. So a Pew Research Center reports the internet is a choice for more than a third of US adults searching for medical information. And if you go to Google and you search for cancer, there's over 800 million results. Next slide, please. And over the last year, we've not only experienced a pandemic, but also an infodemic. You know, the pandemic has shown a very, very bright light on misinformation and the importance of health literacy for health outcomes as online information influences whether people adhere to social distancing rules and decide whether to become vaccinated. Next slide, please. So misinformation can be very dangerous to one's health. The spread of misinformation about the coronavirus on social media has prompted widespread public health campaigns, uh, some of which we've um, spoken about earlier today. Next slide, please. So this is an example of the United Nations is warning people about misinformation. So the internet's ability you know, to disseminate information widely and quickly is really both the disease and the cure. Next slide, please. 
And then here's another example with the World Health Organization in combating the idea that garlic will protect us against the coronavirus. Um, you know, it does say very accurate information. Garlic is healthy, it has antimicrobial properties, but there's no evidence that it'll protect us against the coronavirus when ingested. And there are many, many examples of misinformation online. Um, and you and the ones that you loved, you know, may have lived through this infodemic over the last year. Next slide, please. So knowing the importance of health literacy on health outcomes and the influence of social media, with rising use of technology, the e-health literacy scale was born and includes six different types of literacy. There's you know, scientific literacy, traditional literacy, health literacy, information literacy, media literacy, and computer literacy. And I imagine you know, this is going to be used in the near future as researchers look back on this year regarding the effects of health literacy and how social media has influenced us during the pandemic. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to Maria and Chris, uh, Morissette, Ashley, and Karen for a really good, very informative um, presentation. We're going to Hold the questions actually until the end of the second presenter, um, just so that we could keep going. Um, so our next um, presentation is going to be um, the whole body approach, and that will be with Aishwarya and Chris. So if you guys would like to go ahead, um, the floor is yours. Oh, Chris, you're muted. Thank you for catching that. You would think after this long in the pandemic, I would not have myself muted when talking. But anyway, hello, everyone. My name is Chris, and I'll be talking about the whole body approach here and giving a quick introduction to it. It's bringing health inter interventions into the virtual world is the context in which we're looking at it. Today, I'll be presenting with Aishwarya as well, and Janki Patel helped us put this presentation together and was instrumental in the entire uh, process. So first thing we're gonna go over is a quick reflection activity and I encourage you if you want to throw these ideas or these thoughts into the chat box to share. I'll just give some generalized examples as well. But grab a piece of paper and something to write with. You can just do this mentally or in that chat box and just think about through words, pictures, captions, your thoughts about the relationship between food, weight, and physical activity and health. So I'll give you just about 15 or 20 seconds to kind of mull that over, just thinking about how those things are connected and how you view the relationship between them. And the typical things we see, we hear from this, especially with people who are new to these interventions or new to these programs, is that it's going to be a very regimented or a very strict or um, almost difficult connection between them. You have to count your calories. You have to do this much movement. You have to eat these types of foods and avoid these types of foods. Your weight is a direct reflection upon your health status. Those are the typical things you'll see through most Americans, which is not necessarily true. And that's what this program does a little bit differently uh, than the dominant obesity discourse. It's the first thing is that it is not a weight loss advocate program. It is a healthy choices program. So returning to your internal cues of hunger and movement it doesn't have to be strict hit or weight training exercises. It has to be just functional movements that keep you moving, keep the joints limber, postural cues back into alignment. And with nutrition, it's all about focusing on those internal cues of 
when to eat, what to eat, having a variety of food, the right amount of food, so not overeating, not undereating, really drawing back into those internal cues that we all have in time we probably forgotten about or learned against. I know I was part of the empty plate <laughs> growing up. You had to clear off the whole plate before you could leave the table. And that's not necessarily the healthiest way to be because sometimes your body knows when it's full. And even if your plate's not empty, you'll still eat past that, which is what I did. And those are things that I'm actively learned against, which is what this program is about. It ensures eating is a positive, joyful, and rewarding experience. And we explore new ways to be active that are fun, fit into the schedules. A lot of the people that this program is aimed at have families, have lives going on. You don't have to go a half hour trip to the gym to do an hour long weight training, to do a half hour trip back and waste, not waste, but spend extra time. It's all about getting that functional movement in and enjoyable that fit your schedule and work with your families. And most important, empower the individuals to enjoy their lives while realistically moving towards better overall health. So this is a very useful graphic to kind of contextualize what we were talking about, which is that regardless of your BMI, the number of healthy habits that you participate in greatly affects your health hazard ratio. So as you can see from this table, this first column, people who participate in little to no healthy habits, higher BMI people will have a higher risk of health issues, but with people who participate in many, the risk is almost the same. So that's why it's not a weight loss advocation program. It is a healthy program meant to, um, sorry lost my words there it always happens at least once during these presentations it's a program meant to develop these healthy habits to lower these ratios to minimize health adverse health uh, risk and i'm going to turn it over to aishwarya to go over the whole body approach history uh kind of a background of where it began and where it's going Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris, for uh, starting us off. Um, so I just want to go over some of the history of this project. So this uh, project is actually a, a collaboration with uh, a few community partners. Um, so we are working with the DuPage County Health Department, uh, the Northern Illinois Food Bank, which is of course, a local, it's a pretty big food bank here in, in the Northwest suburbs, um, and also Forward DuPage, which is sort of a coalition that has been working for several years to combat um, obesity, especially childhood obesity um, in the community in DuPage County. Um, so we are working with these partners for this project. So this project actually came about when the DuPage County Health Department, they, they wanted to address health indicators in specifically the Hispanic and Latinx population. Um, and with, with a focus on these health indicators uh, in children and addressing childhood obesity. So when they uh, reached out to, you know, they then reached out to collaborate with the rest of the partners. And obviously that includes us um, at Benedictine um, to, to sort of create a, a comprehensive health program to address uh, these issues. And uh, the food bank actually suggested that we use this method, the whole body approach curriculum, because they had actually used this previously with some of their food pantry recipients. So this project has been going on for a while now. Um, we actually started with the previous round of this intervention where we um, actually administered in-person sessions um, at Addison Library. Um, so this method, you know, proved to have barriers to the participation since, uh, they, you know, they had to attend in person and, uh, you know, lack of time and transportation kind of contributed to uh, some of the barriers that, that we saw in, in that. And, um, you know, because also these, these are working mothers that are, are part of this program. They're working mothers who are part of underserved communities. So this then led to the idea for the second round of the project. And this is going to be conducted virtually and we're gonna be kind of expanding on, um, you know, what we're gonna be doing uh, with, with the virtual uh, part of this. So we are, sec we are conducting the second round as a virtual program to accommodate for uh, busy family and work life. And 
Currently, we are piloting our uh, virtual intervention materials with our community partners uh, before we recruit participants for the project. All right, we can go to the next slide. Awesome, so I'm gonna just talk a little bit about uh, the target population. So uh, this intervention is a Spanish language lifestyle intervention. It is culturally tailored to um, Latina mothers in our community of young children who are recipients of the women, infants and children benefits also known as WIC. And what's really cool about this, we've been able to work with uh, heritage Spanish speakers on our research team in order to be able to culturally tailor, tailor these materials. So it's been super cool to have them on the team and, uh, you know, make sure that we're tailoring it to, you know, specific terminology and have it tailored to, uh, tailored in the best way possible so it's received in the best way possible by this population. So, uh, you know, and there are very few weight inclusive programs that have been done and really not any of them have really examined the effectiveness of the approach in, in low income individuals. So that's really what we're looking at here. And since we know parents also have an influence on the lifestyle of their children, we're focusing on Latina mothers of young children who are WIC recipients because they're also, you know, low income earning and they'll also have a lot of influence on um, their children's health as well. So uh, that's a little bit about, uh, you know, the target population and how we're sort of tailoring our uh, materials to this population. So we can go to the next slide. Great, so I just wanna go over a little, uh, a few of the uh, program outcome objectives. So the whole body approach really, it, it focuses on objectives to cultivate better health behaviors and habits by encouraging participants to listen to their bodies and learn how to eat a variety of foods and enjoy uh, physical activities and movement without the focus on weight loss, because weight loss is not the ultimate goal of this program. So we want the participants to set realistic wellness goals based on their own lives and their own circumstances with the goal of ultimately leading um, a healthier lifestyle um, based on their needs and their customs. So, you know, this is not a diet. This absolutely is not. This is a program that's not focused on, you know, having weight loss as, as the ultimate goal. So like I said, you know, we want the participants to, to discover new ways uh, to develop healthier relationships with food. And this is centered around listening to internal cues and also making sure we also, you know, satisfy our cravings, um, but also develop healthier uh, eating habits. So we want them to be able to incorporate these improved health behaviors into their daily lives and schedules and also be able to include their families um, in, in doing this. So we want the participants to be able to incorporate regular physical activity into their everyday routines as well. Um, and, and the idea here is really to be able to discover movement that is enjoyable to them um, and also adaptable to their own schedules so that they can make this a part of their day and, and they can do this multiple times a week. So we want them to, again, once again, uh, include their families also in, in doing this. And one of the most important objectives of this program is, again, is the focus on healthy living and, and changing health behaviors accordingly. So this is, again, not about weight loss. The, the goal is to develop healthier relationships with food and movement. And regardless, this is regardless of whether they lose weight or not as a result. Uh, they may lose weight as a result of adopting these principles into their daily lives, but that's not the ultimate goal of the program. All right, we can go to the next slide. All right, so I'm just gonna go through some of the general benefits of virtual programming, uh, since this is a virtual program and you know we, we're seeing a lot more virtual programs happening now. Um, so really there are several benefits to virtual programming. And one of these is the fact that we can make materials more accessible to a wider audience. And th that includes people who can't come to in-person sessions. So when we virtually deliver programs, you cut down on the time and money that goes into transportation um, to attend the program. And this ultimately means that the program takes up less time. And it also allows for more flexibility while participating in the program, especially when if you have weekly activities for a program, you know, participants can complete the activities uh, throughout the week and it doesn't have to be done at a set time. And so they can have it be flexible and, uh, you know, 
do it when they can, you know, based on their schedule. So the virtual programs also have a benefit of, of being able to also, you know, continue regardless of conditions that prevent in-person gathering, aka a pandemic that we're in right now. Um, and so programs that are delivered virtually, you know, we're, they're also more cost effective. So uh, like I said, no transportation costs. Um, there's no cost for like reserving uh, in-person spaces for meetings and also no printing of, of any physical materials because everything is, you know, being uh, shared in, in a virtual space. So really virtual programs can, can really help us um, make progress towards health equity. So, you know, we can reach more populations this way. We can make these opportunities more accessible to uh, those who we may not reach through an in-person program. And virtual methods of programming really are, are gonna be the future and are the future of, of public health and, and healthcare and uh, health programming. So um, it, it's really cool to kind of see this shift and see how uh, some of these programs are coming about um, and obviously including ours as well. Um, so we're going to be able to see uh, some of the benefits of that. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. Oh, Chris, you're muted. Did it twice. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, for a quick uh, introduction to how the program will be delivered, then we will continue to discuss about the specifics of it as we go on. But the first one is that it's a virtual program is going to through WhatsApp. It's accessible, convenient, and free to everyone who participates. It's something that a lot of people already have. You can download it on your phone. And it has a group chat for support and information and sharing all of the kind of uh, activity challenges and any struggle looking for advice or support. Chat is going to be a great advocate for that. There are weekly videos and there are weekly activities. Each of them have a different theme for the week. The video is related to the activity and it's a focus for each week. So there is a one week that talks all about one of the initial weeks about enjoyable movement, different types of enjoyable movement. And there's an activity with that about how can you incorporate your whole family or your whole household into those things. They're always aligned. Uh, connected to each other so that it's a cohesive message to live with every week of the program. Uh, Aishwarya, I believe you are going to talk about the study conditions. Yes, so uh, just to kind of go into a little bit of how um, our, our program and, and how the study is set up, um, we are setting it up like a study because we ultimately want to see how effective this program is in, the, in our target population. Um, so as, as uh, Chris mentioned, you know, this intervention is going to be delivered through WhatsApp um, and, you know, it's a commonly used social media app, communication app. Um, it's accessible for free and uh, the materials are going to be delivered weekly and all the materials are topic specific. So each week there's going to be a new topic of focus and each week also is going to include that uh, the to topic focused um, short animated video for the participants to watch. And there's also an accompanying challenge activity that goes with, with each of these videos that they can complete. So they'll have one challenge activity for each week. And all the participants will be in a WhatsApp group. So we'll probably, we'll have small groups of, you know, participants, you know, grouped together um, in, in small groups. And they'll uh, have discussions. Uh, they'll, they'll have the opportunity to have discussions uh, about the video and about the challenge activity. They can also share their responses uh, to the challenge activities and then, um, you know, interact with other uh, participants in the program. Um, and then we also have a, a control condition part of this uh, program because, again, we want to see the effectiveness of the materials and we want to be able to evaluate that. So we do have a control condition. So. Um, these this control condition is also going to be you know 10 weeks of topics but they're not related to healthy eating or physical activity there are they are health related topics but not focusing on healthy eating or physical activity or any of the topics that are addressed in the actual intervention so uh the the topics are health topics that are outside of this um, some of those topics include, you know, proper hand washing, emergency preparedness, um, essential vaccinations, uh, and then oral hygiene. So there, those are some examples some of, of some of the topics that are in 
the control condition. So the control condition is also going to have a weekly video and a challenge activity to go with it. And we're going to be doing, you know, pre and post tests with this uh, to really evaluate the effectiveness again of, of the materials. Um, we can go to the next slide. Great, so um, we just have some screenshots here. So as I mentioned, currently we are piloting the uh, materials with our community partners. So these are some screenshots that we have from um, some of that piloting that we've been doing. So as you can see, uh, you know, we're in WhatsApp um, and really our goal is, you know, act as moderators, share the videos, challenge activities for the participants to complete uh, throughout, you know, throughout uh, e each week. And you know we're also encouraging them to share their responses in the groups and share their responses to the challenge activities with the others uh, in the group. And uh, like, like I said, they're going to be the participants will be put into small uh, groups in WhatsApp to do this. And this method allows for you know easy access for the program materials because we're sharing it right on here. Um, each video is on YouTube and it's just a YouTube link, and then we have the challenge activity on there. Um, and, and this also provides an opportunity for the participants to interact with each other, um, you know, in using this method. All right, we can go to the next slide. And you can see here that these are kind of the topics for each week that we go through. The 10 weeks and all of the uh, topics that the videos go over with the challenge activity associated with them. They're always kind of related. We have practicing mindfulness, which is a whole video about intuitive eating while you're eating. And then the challenge activity is very similar related to that. It is the mindful eating activity where there's a script and a practice element to it where you focus on eating slower in listening to your body, actually enjoying the food. I know all of us are living crazy hectic lives and very often we will eat our lunch as fast as possible to, so we can get back to the day, but it's not necessarily the healthiest thing to do all the time. There's other weeks that talk about activities such as great choices, which is something we'll be going over later, but it's talking about not viewing food as a black or white, good or bad, healthy, unhealthy. It's all a spectrum, nothing is on one end or the other, they're all kind of in color gray, different shades of gray. And listening to your body, listening to your social cues, managing stress are the key takeaways for most of these videos and uh, reflection and introduction topics as well. So I believe the video clip is here. We're going to play just a short minute and a half clip from one of our videos about the Intuitive Eating Bill of Rights, which is simply a list of rules, especially around the holidays, that can help you um, just be mindful of what you're eating and not be pressured by family and surroundings to eat more or less than you're comfortable with. Help you foster inner peace with food, mind, and body. The Intuitive Eating Bill of Rights, what is that? Well, it means you have the right to savor your meal without judgment and without discussion of calories eaten or the amount of exercise needed to burn off said calories. You have the right to enjoy second servings without apology. You have the right to honor your fullness, even if it means saying no thank you to dessert or a second helping of food. It is not your responsibility to make someone happy by overeating, even if it took hours to prepare a specialty holiday dish. You have the right to say no thank you without explanation when offered more food. You have the right to stick to your original answer of no, even if you are asked multiple times. Just calmly and politely repeat no thank you. You have the right to eat pumpkin pie for breakfast. Nancy, remember, no one except for you know how you feel, both emotionally and physically. Only you can be the expert of your body, which requires listening to your inner cues, rather than the external, well-meaning, suggestions from family. Wow, I never thought about this way. Gabriella. I feel empowered already. I'm going to keep this list on my refrigerator. I can definitely incorporate these tips into my life, especially during the holidays. That's awesome to hear, Nancy. Small changes really can make a big difference. Help you help you foster inner peace with food, mind, 
and we are going to go over I apologize if that video was a little choppy. I keep getting warnings that my internet connection is unstable, so hopefully it wasn't too bad. But with the last few minutes of our time before we go into question and answer, I just want to go over a few of these activity exercises that we have in the program, such as mindful intuitive eating, which is being in the moment from distractions and non-judgment, uh, keeping yourself aware of your internal cues uh, with your hungry, stress, which are things that often lead to uh, excess eating. If you're low on energy, if you're satisfied or full, there is the gray choices activity, which I touched on earlier, which is not inherently black or white food. It's that you recognize food good or bad. You're striving for of different foods, colors, flavors, and textures. And then enjoyable movement, which is focusing on the short-term benefits of movement and not worrying about the exact amount, the kind, the calories, the heart rate, anything like that. And when we say short-term, we mean things like uh, exercise in the first week that you begin a regular exercise program, you're going to see differences in how you sleep, differences in energy level. That's what we mean by short-term benefits, not the long-term weight loss that often in focus of these sorts of programs, but rather aligning your getting better quality sleep, reducing stress, those are the kind of benefits we go for. One of my favorite lines from any movie is from uh, Legally Blonde, where she says that exercise makes you happy. Happy people don't just kill their husbands. It's very accurate. It does regulate our hormone levels and it is very important. And while, just to kind of wrap up, we gonna touch on the shift to which is a pattern we're seeing everywhere. The whole body approach intended to shift to the virtual world before the pandemic began to make it more accessible and effective for our participants. But now, because of the pandemic, and we, uh, I believe somebody spoke earlier, I can't remember the name, I apologize, spoke about limited access physically to health and fitness facilities. We've seen a lot of shift into virtual and telehealth, telemedicine, which is probably going to remain a huge influence and in the future of this whole industry because the pandemic driven move into the virtual world was driven around accessibility and safety but virtual programming is the future of wellness because of its sustainability its cost effectiveness and the fact that it becomes more holistic you're teaching people how to be healthy within their own homes rather than having to take their health care outside of their homes into a health or fitness facility where it usually stays there. It's now more a holistic view on their whole life, trying to stay healthy in many different aspects. So we're just going to touch back on that reflection activity from earlier after learning about this program and the approaches that we're trying to engage in these activities. Have your ideas regarding the relationship between food, activity, health shifted at all. And this is, as you saw, a 10 week program. Obviously, the this half hour is been spanning the entire course of the program, but hopefully a little eye opening or maybe just a little perspective shifting on it. And feel free to type any of those things in the chat box. We also have I'm here for some questions. Uh, I believe this is for both sections of the presentation, not just ours. So I will stop my screen share and turn it over to, I'm not sure who, honestly, but. It will be to me, Chris. It will be to Ali. Um, so, yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. And we are opening up to questions for both presentations. I have both of the names of the presentations as well as the speakers. Um, so if anyone would like to come off mute and go ahead and ask your question or feel free to uh, type it in the chat box. Any other questions or comments? If not, um, we will be sharing these presentations um, as well as um, that have the contacts of um, all the presenters as well 
if there is something you could think of after. Um, and so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Ashwarya. She'll close it out. Awesome. Thank you, Ali. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here uh, and, you know, uh, participating in our um, presentations today. Um, thank you all to, to the fellow presenters as well. Um, so really, I just want to take a minute to close out. This is our, as I mentioned, our last evening of the uh, conference this year. Um, it's been a super awesome experience. I hope all of you um, have learned a lot. I know some of you have attended multiple days, so I've, I hope that you have um, learned something. And if you want to drop in the chat, you know, one thing that you've learned over these last four days, uh, definitely share that with us. Um, we'd love to hear uh, you know, something that you've learned, because uh, that's ultimately something, you know, we want to achieve, we want everyone to, to learn something new um, throughout these four days. So um, if you want to drop that in the chat, feel free to. Um, but yeah, really, uh, we just, I just want to take a minute to talk about, um, you know, how, how to stay in touch and kind of how to build on what we've learned over these last few days. And that's really going to be, you know, we've cre created a LinkedIn group uh, for our attendees for this conference um, through our public health student organization page. Um, we're hoping that you guys will join us on there on LinkedIn to co uh, connect with all of us. And uh, we also will have um, presenters, uh, you know, that we, we've had over the last four days joining in that group as well to connect with them. Um, so we encourage you guys to, to join that so we can connect and continue our conversations on public health um, in that group and, and, and continue to do that. Um, you know, next week is National Public Health Week. So, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping to continue the conversation um, around public health, um, you know, going in, into the future. So definitely join us there. Um, I know we've dropped the link in the chat a couple of times. So, and we'll also be sending that out uh, as well as with uh, all, all of um, our um, presentations and, and links to our social media and things like that. We will be sending those out as well um, in our post uh, uh, conference emails. So definitely look out for that. Um, and then just a couple of other things I wanted to touch on. So uh, I just want to talk about a couple of things that you all can do to, you know, continue to be involved in public health, um, you know, outside of your classes and things, uh, you know, obviously, if you're part of our program, we are always looking for new members of the public health student organization. So definitely let us know if you're interested in joining. Um, we still have a couple months left, uh, you know, in, in, this, in the year. So we will be doing, a, you know, a couple more activities and, and things. So definitely feel free to join us. Um, you can email us at venue phso at gmail.com if you're interested in joining. Um, so definitely reach out to us there, reach out to us on LinkedIn. We have a LinkedIn page as well. Um, so feel free to do that. Um, also, uh, you know, get involved in, if, if you live in Illinois, you know, our Illinois Public Health Association is a great way to be involved in state level, you know, activities. There are so many um, sections that you can be involved in. And I'm, I'm, I know I'm gonna pass it to Chris in a little bit to talk about um, some activities IPHA is gonna be doing for National Public Health Week next week. So um, definitely make sure to join for that. And, uh, you know, also, you know, join IPHA as well, you know, they're a great organization and you get to get, be involved in a lot of stuff there um, and, and, you know, really explore your interests in public health. It's definitely a great way to sort of discover what you're interested in doing and what path you're interested in taking in public health. Um, also, I want to talk about a, an, an opportunity uh, through the Illinois Department of Public Health. Um, they're actually looking for uh, COVID-19 ambassadors. So, uh, and we'll send out this link as well in our post-conference email, but um, they have this really cool program where they're looking for COVID-19 ambassadors to basically be um, ambassadors or, you know, representatives, uh, you know, in public health to, to sort of combat, uh, you know, misinformation, but also just like get more information out about uh, COVID, you know, and, and vaccine. And so they're kind of looking for, um, you know, leaders in the community to, to help do this and, and help, um, you know, talk to their friends, their peers and people in their community and, and um, get out accurate information about the virus and about the vaccine. So um, that's definitely a really cool opportunity to uh, be involved in public health. Um, you don't have to, uh, 
you know, have any prior experience in doing that or anything. So it's really cool. They're even, um, you know, they provide the training and everything like that. So really, they're also asking community members, even who are not of public health background to, to join as well. So um, it's a really cool opportunity. And we'll share more about that in our in our post uh, conference email as well. So that's a cool opportunity for you all to be involved in as well. Um, so we encourage you to uh, uh, join that. And um, yeah, other than that, uh, those are some of the things I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm gonna pass it to, um, I think we're, we're gonna pass it to Ellie first to uh, talk about a couple of things uh, post-conference and then we'll pass it to Chris to talk about um, National Public Health Week uh, next week. Thanks, Aish. Um, so just one more uh, reminder, and as well as uh, we will be putting this in all of the emails that we'll be sending out, so don't feel like you have to remember everything or write things down. Um, we will go ahead and share this all, all this in an email. Um, but in the coming weeks, you guys will be um, getting information on a donation form. Um, this will all go for to help funds for PHSO to be able to do very cool activities, whether it's this conference or anything else that we think would be very beneficial to uh, the grad, the graduate program or even the community around us or even across the nation um, with all of our um, MPH students. And so um, information for the donation form will be made available shortly. And if you do donate up to a certain amount, you will be able to get a cool t-shirt. Um, so I will go ahead and uh, pass it over to Chris, and I believe he will be uh, sharing some more information. All right. Hello, everybody. Me again. So next week is the official National Public Health Week for pretty much everyone. They said that I do early, and I think that was a really smart idea. I got a lot of great attendance and super excited for everyone to join. So next week, just kind of the events that are going on. For day one, there's gonna be presentations by the Illinois Area Health Centers, along with Christopher Hoff, who is the Director of Health Services for DuPage County Department of Public Health, which is great. Day two, that I'm very excited about, there is a bystander intervention training to combat the rise of Asian hate that will be presented by Catherine Shia, who is representative of Asians, um, Asian American Advancing Justice, along with topics um, that will be covered, such as gender justice in the age of electronic health records, addressing the elderly in pandemics. And there is a special guest speaker, Dr. Johnson Walker, who will present their congressional testimony on infectious diseases. Day